It's hot outside, but it's always a cool conversation on our program here, Moral Side of the News. Welcome. I'm John Blim with the WHAS Crusade for Children. With me, as always, is our distinguished panel, Rabbi Stan Miles, Louisville Milton School, Reverend David Harkle Road, South Point Church, New Albany, Reverend Jason Crosby, Crescent Hill Baptist Church, and Father John Stoltz, St. Aloysius Catholic Church. Welcome to you, panel. We start today with the ongoing debate over gun laws. Today's discussion is prompted by the man being called both a hero and a good Samaritan after using his concealed weapon to kill a man who had opened fire at a mall in Indiana, killing three people. 22-year-old Elijah Dickin fired 10 rounds from his handgun, killing the alleged shooter. Greenwood Police Chief Jim Eisen said, quote, his actions were nothing short of heroic, end of quote. So, panel, there are many versions of state and federal laws in the works regarding concealed carry and legal ownership of guns. Does this mall shooting affect of how affect how you weigh in on the topic? It's very confusing. Uh, you know, I, I believe in gun control, and I still believe in gun control. This situation. I couldn't help but compare it to the immense tragedy at the elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. And one person with a gun did what so many police personnel on site didn't do or couldn't do or wouldn't do. And so I'm, I'm really kind of vexed because, honestly, I always looked upon this as a black and white issue, and this forced me to see gray areas. Stan, I'll just jump in and say I appreciate your honesty there and your openness to think through it. I've also tried to weigh uh, these issues really carefully. And I, I do think there's a place for gun control. I'm not against gun control, but I, I think that the media has suppressed a lot of these stories, truthfully. If you dig into it, there have been a lot of instances where armed citizens have stopped or deterred mass shootings, and uh, they, they often get overlooked. And, you know, just, just being on the moral side of the news, I would say uh, what this young man did was a moral good. And uh, even some of it is an outcome of Indiana state law, this constitutional carry, which I think has been a, in a sense, a morally good thing for our state. Uh, there are complexities, uh, certainly. I think I was on an episode, we had an episode a couple months ago, talking about uh, concealed carry in courthouses, which is a whole nother element. Uh, but Stan, just saying, yeah, I appreciate that. I think there are, are positives to having armed citizens. I think there's a real deterrent that often is overlooked in the argument. Well, I appreciate that comment as well. Uh, a, a couple of thoughts that come to my mind is that the family of Trayvon Martin might might um, consider Indiana legislation such as standard ground laws differently. Um, and that's the downside, right? Um, the upside is that you do have a situation like what occurred um, in Indiana last week that uh, could have been worse. Uh, the downside to such legislation is that you have situations where you have young kids walking home after buying Skittles in a soft drink, and they get shot in the back. Um, and so what do we do with that from a moral perspective, right? Uh, it's a complicated question, um, and it's not one that I, I think can easily be answered. Um, in terms of how the media reports it, one thing I found interesting in my reading about this is that um, what was buried in the, the reporting on this is that three people died before, um, um, before the perpetrator was stopped. Um, and, and so, uh, yes, uh, there might be some media slant from time to time. And there are some instances, uh, as you noted, uh, that have occurred where a, a good guy with a gun has been able to stop what could have been a more catastrophic situation. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, we're dealing with mass shootings on a daily basis. Um, the, the way in which our country is inundated with guns at the moment means um, that 
that at the moment is I'm trying to read the tea leaves and I understand their nuances, um, the way in which we are just awash with guns um, uh, on the whole is a, a net detriment um, to us as, as a society. Um, although there are some outliers like this. One last thing I'll say um, is that uh, to your point about being open to gun reform and legislation and, and uh, uh, Rabbi Miles, to your comment, he, he did not have a, an automatic weapon. My understanding is that he had a rifle, but not a semi-automatic rifle. There you go. That's the point. Um, you know, we might be in a much more effective situation whereby somebody, a good guy, quote unquote, with a handgun can stop somebody uh, with a non-automatic rifle. Um, but because of the proliferation of such, such weaponry, um, and, and to contrast it to Uvalde, um, when the police come in, even with the, the weapons that they had at their disposal, their hands are tied. Um, so, so for me, it it's, remains black and white when it comes to certain issues regarding uh, gun control. Um, some things are more complicated, but, but this is yet another indicator to me that automatic weaponry needn't be in the hands of civilians um, or a good guy with a gun, a handgun, couldn't have done anything. Yeah, I, I, um, I do think this, is, this remains, it has been before, a complicated issue. And what we see, because it's complicated, are several realities present. We see someone who uses, in a sense, you call it, I guess, self-defense or defense and does so properly, and it works, and that's good. You see police officers who are unable to do it, or as it, the investigation is showing right now. It's a complicated issue. A couple of thoughts that I have in mind are that um, is, is I, as it's complicated, I am fearful of a defensive culture. Uh, with lots of people owning guns with the possibility, the small possibility that they themselves could use them in a situation that's rightful. Understand, my fear around that is that for someone using a gun uh, in, a, in a situation like that, there's a tremendous burden being put on them. They are acting as police, the courts, and the warden all three at once, one person in the matter of just a small amount of time, which requires a thought. Well, no wonder, I mean, there are incidences when it doesn't work, when it's an error, well, no wonder. It's too much to put on a person. Besides that, as human beings, part of our full humanity and my sense is coming to terms with our own vulnerability. And the fact is part of that is related to that we die as all of us, that's the ultimate vulnerability that we have. But the sense of coming to terms in everyday reality and experience that we're vulnerable people and that we have to learn that there's a reality with that we can't control that makes us vulnerable, a reality that we can control, which means we're called to control it. And, and there's that difference between the two. Now I'm basing that on a very popular prayer called the serenity prayer, but that's part of the experience we have. A culture of self, uh, of de de sort of a defense culture where lots of people are carrying guns and all of that is in some ways not really seeing what really is part of a human, our human reality as, as I see it. And then finally, I want to leave it with it, say that if I'm fearful of a defense culture like that, I would much prefer that we look at and we seek to be a peacemaking culture which sometimes people look at peacemaking as being passive. And I would prefer that, uh, as many others would say, and I've learned that peacemaking is an intentional act that is a discipline and a skill and something you learn and a way that we relate to one another. And that that has its, has its advantages in our society. Recognizing that reality says that we have incidences of violence that we can't seem to control and we have it there. So it, that all of that are complicated remarks, I think, re, re, sort of looking at a very complicated reality and maybe not the best way to express it, but that's what I'm seeing through all of this. John, I think uh, one, 
you know, one of the things I think we're trying to do on the moral side and model is civil discourse. And I appreciate that. I believe every individual on this panel wants the same outcome. We want less death. Uh, we want to see an end to violence. And we may have nuanced or even, even larger differences at times on how that would come about. But I would hope to see our politicians, our neighbors, coming together and having better discussions about how to resolve these problems. So I'm agreeing with you, John. Like, how do we resolve these problems instead of, uh, you know, just polarizing and taking extreme stances on one side or another? Um, because I, I think everyone, I think, has at some level acknowledged this is really complex. Also, just wanted to acknowledge, uh, I really appreciate your point about vulnerability, <laughs> human vulnerability. Uh, that was a, a big talking point for me during COVID with our folks who had a lot of fear. Uh, we can be cautious. We should be cautious. And yet uh, the Christian hope is ultimately that death will uh, in the end be defeated by Jesus Christ and not, not caution and precaution only or primarily. So uh, yeah, I appreciate mm -hmm. your points, John. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I look at peacemaking, I, I think about, the fact that it is, it puts, it's a, it, peacemaking is a courageous act because it puts us in a position that is not necessarily a comfortable position. It compels us to reach out to and relate to people who we would look at and tragically see as the other or people who would look at us and see us at, as the other and to, to make peace and to, to bring understanding, we have to simply look one another in the eye and honestly and forthrightly communicate with respect. Mm -hmm. So with the tragedy at Greenwood Mall that we just witnessed last week, do you anticipate there'll be more people like Elijah Dickin who will pack a sidearm or say, this is a good idea? Or what do you think the next steps are for just the average citizen as we go forward? Well, I, I think, John, this, this will embolden others. Um, but I think this, the, the narrative, the good guy with a gun narrative at this point is so deeply entrenched culturally um, that um, it, I don't think this will move the needle that much. Uh, and, and, you know, a rush to folks to go out and, and arm themselves. Um, I, I, I hope at this point that the lines have, have kind of been drawn and, and that um, this, this um, certain narrative when it comes to gun ownership um, has, has run its course. But I do, I do hope and I do want to, you know, just note this that, you know, the, the data is clear. I mean, the, the good guy with a gun um, situation is the outlier. That is not <laughs> consistent with um, the reality in which we see ourselves. And I think one thing we have to be careful about on this issue or any issue is reasonable minds that are trying um, to seek a common outcome, which is peace, is uh, that we don't get trapped into um, uh, certain narratives that are really easy to spin uh, that are being spun by interest groups with very vested interests um, that, that um, result in padding bottom lines for, you know, members of the NRA, for instance. Um, you know, the reality is that the data shows that because of the proliferation of guns in our society, people are dying every single day. It, it, even in reports I read about this particular instance, uh, it was reported at that mall that there had been guns that had been accidentally discharged within that mall just in the last few months. Um, and so that that's just another example of the way uh, in which, yes, this outcome turned out largely on the whole positive. But because of the proliferation of guns um, everywhere we turn, um, we're, we're vulnerable, um, yeah. as, as we've touched upon previously. <clears throat> I, I think the vulnerability issue is really, it's really changed our behavior. I know it's changed mine because when I am outside in a situation, when I'm out of my house in a situation, more often than not, I will be masked 
And uh, if there is someone in close proximity to me, to wit on an airplane or something like that, who is not masked, I don't feel comfortable with regard to uh, with regard to being out in public in a in a situation like a house of worship, like a theater, like an arena. I didn't do this two or three years ago, but now the first thing I do, and especially if it's a place I've I've never entered before. I develop, when I walk in and sit down, the first thing I develop is an exit strategy. I look for ways out. Should I need to find that way out quickly and expeditiously? It's, it's, it's a new and different world. It's, it's not what I've hoped and dreamed for, but it's something that I, that I realize that I have to adjust to for myself, for my safety and the safety of those folks with me. We're certainly yeah, living in a different era, a different time. Uh, my wife and I are talking about going up to Indianapolis on Tuesday uh, to be part of a showing for the SB1 bill. Indianapolis, Indiana uh, has a, a bill coming up to curtail abortion. We feel very strongly for that. Um, and, and we would be taking our kids and we had a whole discussion about the potential for violence around a volatile topic like this. Um, and do we want to take our children into that scenario? And so I think it is a, I think it is a real question in people's minds in, in everyday life now. Very good. We'll move on to our second topic on moral side of the news. Thank you for watching and listening. We're about halfway through our program, turning now to two Kentuckians who left a lasting impact. Muhammad Ali is a hero to some, a controversial figure to others. Troy Kinnaman has spent 30 years collecting 1,600 keepsakes of the boxer, and now his collection is up for auction. Meantime, Dr. Alan Lansing, a pioneering surgeon, has died at age 92. He performed the first kidney transplant and first coronary bypass surgery in Kentucky and was part of the team that implemented, excuse me, implanted the second artificial heart in the U.S. in 1984. His obituary hints at his regret of letting his professional accomplishments usurp his role as a father. So, panel, what can we take away from these two accomplished human beings? I think there's a, a direct connection between these two souls. And that connection is on, the, on Muhammad Ali's tombstone. It's a quote from, from the champ. Service to others is the rent you pay for your room in heaven. I think we, that definitely is applicable to Muhammad Ali and to Dr. Alan Lansing. And Dr. Lansing's regret is a regret so many of us who are in public positions, be those positions through medicine, through uh, sports and entertainment, or through the clergy. We have to make decisions. And sometimes the decision goes with our livelihood, our calling, our profession, at the expense of our families. And it's, we both, I think everyone in this room this morning has experienced that. And it's one of the toughest aspects of our type of lifestyle choices. Well, I, I think it's a testament to the fact that Louisville, Kentucky in particular, in the middle and latter part of the uh, 20th century, um, uh, there, there were individuals that, that called our community home that had an impact um, far beyond the, the boundaries of our city. Um, and um, it is my belief and hope that our city continues to put in place uh, the support infrastructure and, and individuals to help nurture future generations uh, that are growing up in our community to go forth and do incredible things. Muhammad Ali uh, may have never put on a pair of boxing gloves if he hadn't met um, Officer Martin, the police officer that 
uh, pointed him in the direction uh, of the, the gym where he first began to box. Uh, Dr. Lansing uh, wouldn't have been able to come to Louisville, Kentucky to perform um, heart surgeries, the first kidney transplant in the state, if there wasn't investment uh, in the University of Louisville. Uh, so it takes that kind of investment at both the individual and collective level uh, for people to be in our city and for their talents to shine. Uh, and so that, that's one point of connection I see between these two individuals is that people uh, individually and collectively invested in, in Muhammad Ali and Dr. Lansing, and that then provided a, a springboard from which they could go forth and literally change lives and worlds. They were both very talented people um, uh, who gave a lot. And, and as you introduced Muhammad Ali as both controversial and, and popular. I'm thinking about time and the fact that as I have understood his history, that more earlier when he was younger, he was a more of a controversial figure. And it seems, I think, later on in his life, he became one who was more popular. And as we talked about peacemaking earlier, I could see him as someone who's very uh, devoted to interfaith relationships and also peacemaking and world relationships too. So that be, being because, and he had, he had that international fame. And so he, he was a steward of that, I think. And so, um, and I think not too long ago, what this conversation immediately brings to my mind is his funeral and, and, and the popularity in our city around him for, the, for that funeral. So many people speaking about that day being just an extraordinary moment. And um, for the, the, the funeral profession, the people who stood in line, the funeral procession. Uh, and so um, I, I think of them both that way of uh, people who really in many ways giving their talents uh, for, the, for the good of, of humanity and both coming from this local area residing here. I've been thinking about uh, just reading these two articles, a few things. One is just influence. I think we've been, a couple of you touched on that, but uh, all of us have influence, different levels, different amounts with different people. But uh, some of the articles just really highlighted how uh, the influence these men had, uh, had effect to good and bad at different times, depending on the decisions they made. And so just something that we all have to think about, uh, far less fame than these two, but, but we have influence. Uh, it has me thinking about the value of work. And I think Jason, you were kind of touching on some of that, but wildly different careers, both with uh, just really, really good outcomes, a lot of influence, a lot of productivity in, in positive things and good. And then lastly, just mortality. I'm ever amazed uh, how quickly even famous people slip from history. Uh, many of us can't even name our presidents. And outside of Louisville, I don't know how many generations uh, would be able to remember even Muhammad Ali for long. And so uh, just remembering that, that the lives we impact, the immediate lives we impact, have some of the most relevance in the, the things that we do. I think in reading both those articles, my dad used to have an expression that life is peaches and cream. But when you we read between the lines and when you hear Dr. Lansing's son say, I don't have a father and Lansing himself saying, it's been a sad thing that my family has taken a second place to my work. We begin to realize not everybody's life is rosy. It may appear so on the surface, but we're all complicated and have our own struggles, if you will. Is that about a fair thing to say? We're all human. Uh, it, John, I, I think you hit the nail on the head um, that, you know, there's, there, there are perceptions that people have of each of us, of all of us, um, for better or worse. Uh, it cuts both ways. Uh, but the reality is that um, everyone's life is much more complicated than we could ever imagine. Um, you know, I, I believe that, that the line that I have heard often stated is, be kind because you really never know what that other person is actually going through. Uh, despite whatever persona um, might be put forth. I think um, people, this mirrors a lot of what the comments have, have said, but in these words that 
that as human beings, we have our gifts and we have our struggles. And sometimes, I, maybe for famous people, the gifts shine out so much, you know, and that the struggles remain uh, within. Um, and, um, and, but, that, but that's something that every person has that, that, that we deal with. And we can deal with it in ways of the choices can we can be can be choices that that are really to give great things and the choices can be dark, but it also can be in the sense of strengths and weaknesses in our own personality, that there are things that that we're good at and some things that we're not so good at, you know, and and, and all of us are like that. And it requires, I think, relationships really to make us whole. Our friendships really, it's not what we just aren't, I cannot be on our own. We've got to have, we got to have others with us too, to build us up. Excellent. Well, a good way to end our program, Moral Side of the News, a quick story. The Muhammad Ali procession, you talked about that. I took a picture of Will Smith as he went by in the limo. I tweeted it. And the next thing my I know, I went viral, which was a big deal for me. So <laughs> Will Smith in a limo on Twitter. That'll bring to a close our program, Moral Side of the News, this week. Thank you to Stan Miles, David Harkelroad, Jason Crosby, and John Stoltz. If you'd like to catch this program again or any program from the past year or so, just go to YouTube and search for Moral Side of the News, and you'll find it there. And you can also listen, listen to Moral Side as a podcast wherever you get your podcast. So until next week, thank you, panel, and have a great week. Moral Side of the News is now in its 70th year, making it one of America's longest-running public affairs programs. Thank you for making it part of your weekend. When you give to the kids, what does your money buy? The easy answer is technology, but it's so much more than that. iPads have been around for more than a decade. Today, special software on an iPad means children with special needs can interact with a simple touch. Without an iPad, communication would be a struggle. An iPad like this can improve literacy, communication, and motor skills. And it can touch so many children, including those with hearing and visual impairment and youngsters with developmental delays. What does this touching therapy cost? With your $300 donation or three donations of $100, a crusade supported agency can put an iPad like this one into the hands of another child with special needs. Go to whascrusade.org and click on Donate to make a secure online donation. Thanks for making the 69th annual WHAS Crusade for Children a big success. But you can still join in on the fun. Send your donation to WHAS Crusade for Children, 520 West Chestnut Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40202. That's 520 West Chestnut Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40202. Also, go online to whascrusade.org. That's whascrusade.org and see the many ways you can help change a child's life. We'll be back again next week with an all-new conversation on Moral Side of the News. Please join us then. So long for now.